Why, hello there, wizards and wanderers alike. Shams Nelson here from Pen and Blade. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about these regions on this map that I drew. It's part of the Ten Dragon Regions, which I will explain the meaning of shortly. And this is where my girlfriend's first Dungeons and Dragons campaign took place, of course, in classic DM style. I drew an entire region map when it all took place in Eldale. Um, so this really wasn't necessary, but we might have some other adventurers joining the party and it may lead them to other lands. And I just thought it'd be cool to make a video documenting the lore of these lands and, um, so that they and you can be transported into this mystic realm. So the first thing we shall start with is Eldale and then maybe just move from the uh, top of the map down to the bottom and just talk about the important features. But before any of that, we must begin with the ancient history of all of these lands. Um, so 300 or so years ago, uh, these land, all these lands were, um, and more, were, uh, this is probably a third of the size of the continent, I would say were uh, under the subjugation of the dragon clans, these dragons who were very rude and um, evil, basically. And they enslaved the humanoid races, having them serve them and just treating them very unkindly, to say the least. So eventually, the humanoid races banded together against the dragons and fought them, um, which began as a losing battle, but with the help of these legendary dragon slayers who were all um, dedicated to this god goddess of justice, of, of order and peace. They were given, um, they were, there were these seven dragon slayers who were given these legendary magic items which allowed them to stand toe to toe with these mighty dragons. And it all came down at the end, at a huge battle over here, which is now called Dragon Death Swamp because the lands have been cursed by the death, both man or humanoid and dragon alike. There are great dragon skeletons in here. I might even draw a dragon skeleton in here. That'd be pretty cool. And, um, you know, just like zombies or ghouls or ghosts, and just this is Dragon Death Swamp. So that's all you need to know about that, that many have fallen and their spirits still haunt and remain in this region. So since then, one of the stipulations that the deity gave to the dragon slayers when handing them their weapons of might, their mighty legendary weapons, was that they would show mercy to the dragons if they should ask for it, which they did. And so, um, because, you know, if they were to just destroy the dragons and be as merciless as the dragons themselves, then that would solve nothing. They would just be replacing one tyrant for another. And the other stipulation was that once their work was complete, that they would disappear with their legendary items and um, never to be seen again, which they did. And it is said that if the, the any, any of these legendary weapons are uncovered, or, or found by humans again, that the dragons would once again rise. The balance and the blessing of this deity um, would be removed and the world would return to the state it was in before where humanoids and dragons were, you know, battle each other and just don't, don't get along. So the mercy that was, that was uh, allowed to them was that the elder dragon of each type, so you have the chromatic dragons, the blue, green, um, white, black, and red, uh, were, and then the metallic ones, the gold, silver, copper, was it, I think, bronze, and the last one, <laughs> um, were all allowed to, that the elder of each of them, of each of those kinds, would be allowed to live. And in doing so, would serve one of the great cities. So you see Eldale 
is, is the crown is served by the gold dragon. And so the humans, and here Castle Eithtooth, the white dragon, Berkshire is the red. So the humans would then supply the dragons with the golds and treasures that they so covet. And in return, the dragons would protect the humans, and not or the humanoids, and not, um, you know, like eat them or whatever. <laughs> so, so each of these have one of the the strongest eldest, usually the eldest, the strongest dragon of each of the uh, colors, of each of the types, would serve the crown, the the leader of each of these major cities. And so this is the balance that has been at play for the last 300 years. So this brings us to Eldale. Eldale is the realm that is ruled by the Cornwallis, Corn, Cornwallow family, King Myron of Eldale, Myron Cornwallow, and Queen Lorraine. And their son is Prince Harris Cornwallow, who is being uh, wed to the Princess of Zahir, uh, Princess Warda, to create a alliance between the two because they have long uh, skirmished over Red Rock, where beautiful rubies are mined. And it has changed hands many times, but this is supposed to cement a peaceful alliance. And this is what the uh, Amwara, my girlfriend's character, um, she was able to save Prince uh, Prince Cornwallow, who was whose body was switched with that of a mouse and thrown into a dungeon, and so she took the mouse and was able to have them switch their bodies back. But no one knows, no one saw who did this. So there is some um, there is a conspiracy afoot, but we shall get into that as the tale unfolds. For now, what should be known of Eldale, aside from that. The crown is, is uh, the Cornwallows, are the rulers, and Belron, the gold dragon, is the uh, you know, patron dragon of this city, is that there are also five uh, mighty mages. Oh, that sounds cool. We'll go with that. The five mighty mages of Eldale, and these are Celeria of the Starlight Den, Olaris, the court wizard, so the Starlight Den, She's um, this very mysterious cave. I won't go into it yet right here. Olaris, the court wizard. He serves the, the king in the court and uh, where, the, where the dragon you know, lives in the castle. Um, Mira, the wise of Lake Tower. There's a lake in Eldale and a tower in the midst of it where she uh, imparts her wisdom upon the common folk. Melphis, the mysterious who is rarely seen, and actually no one has seen him except for those who, who um, of a high royalty. He appears and disappears, and um, no one really knows where he's based. And then Beauregard, the linguist of Scriptorium Tower, of which Amwara is the um, apprentice. So each of these five mighty mages has a certain, has an apprentice and one apprentice at a time, who will then take over their position as it's a um, kind of like a official position within Eldale. One, one of these wizards is required at each of these posts at each time, or that is basically the tradition. So um, what's going to, to, to occur is that the characters joining the party in, will begin in Eldale as well, and they each have a certain... Um, uh, reason to seek favor with the Beauregard. Perhaps they want something for him, he, they owe him a debt, they um, just want to, um, you know, rise in the ranks of importance. Um, so Beauregard is the, is the linguist. They say there is no tongue on this realm or any other that Beauregard cannot fathom. You see, he, is, uh, he knows all the languages. So that's enough about Eldale, and this is a kind of an Eldale-centric map, as you might be able to tell. So this was a map that was produced in Eldale itself, so this is why it shows mostly the surrounding regions. Salim Salam, the deserts go off far to the east, so most of it is desert, but there are 
um, the nomadic folks living about until you get across that arid, these arid lands. But since the here is the most closely related, we'll talk about that. But first, let's talk just a little bit about the different towns. So all the way up until Lyra, Lyra is part of Calaris. Um, we have a few small towns that are part of the kingdom of Eldale. Uh, we have Millshire, where all of the best baked goods are produced. You know, very beautiful. They have a annual, uh, you know, baking contest sort of thing. Red Rock we've spoken about. It's a mining city, and it produces the mo like lots of rubies, particularly, hence the name. Burke is also a mining town, which provides its steel or, or its uh, iron ore to Nuxley, particularly where the best uh, blacksmiths are found in Eldale. And the story with Nuxley and Fonsberg, they're at a bit of a rivalry because you see Nuxley long ago, um, well, Fonsberg and Nuxley are the, are the surnames of two families who moved down here and founded this city. And the king, they had, were trying to figure out what to name the city. And the king decided to have, he needed blacksmiths of the highest quality. That's what they required at the time. So um, this was right before the Dragon War. So um, they wanted, you know, great weapons to fight against these beasts. So what happened is he had a contest. And the Nuxley, the families of Nuxley and Fonsberg each produced the highest quality um you know, weapons or blacksmith smithery that they could, and Nuxley won, and so the city was named after him. So in a somewhat of a rage, Fonsberg um, abandoned the city, crossed the river, went upstream, and decided that he would fish out all the fish so that Nuxley would not be able to feed itself easily or, or provide, and then they would have to buy the fish from Fonsberg, and, um, and then they would, you know, kind of, get last laugh. And it kind of worked out. And so they, they, they abandoned blacksmithery and focused all on fishing. So this is quite the fishing village and they do a lot of uh, basically fishing in this river. But they buy their, you know, hooks and knives and such from Nuxley because of course they make the best, the best tools. So there's kind of a symbiotic relationship, but also a continued rivalry that, you know, people just don't let go of things like that for some reason. So this that gives you an idea of Eldale. Zahir, you know, this is a more Arabian town here. This is a great oasis, uh, very wealthy traders who, who bring in goods from the far east to into these uh, western lands because this is the main pass between them. There's no real other good way to get through here. Um, so that's why this city has become, and as well as Red Rock, but mostly Zahir is, uh, Zahar is, um, uh, what's it called? Has a lot of, a lot of cash. And Gazim is actually like, this is like the vacation city for Zaharans, um, when they need, like, the most wealthy. There's kind of a dark, dark history up here because slavery has been outlawed in these lands, you know. There's not really any slavery going on, at least not on a systemic level. But the one place where it still exists is Gazim. And the rule is that one can sell themselves into slavery, I guess, to either pay off a debt or to create wealth for their family or for whatever reason. But they have to willingly choose to sell their own lives into slavery, and their children don't become slaves and stuff like that. So basically, the only the most wealthy, and so one thing they'll do is like criminals might like sell themselves to get protection or to get out of jail. You know, a powerful person from Gazim might um, be able to get them out of jail in Zahar, and be in return they would, you know, serve them for the rest of their lives, sort of thing. And so, like a lot of these servants are criminals or you know, gamblers who fell into dark, deep debt or things like that. And you'd think that you wouldn't want servants like that because, you know, they might kill you, basically, or run off or whatever. But since the people of Gazim are so wealthy, they have all sorts of magic items that protect them from those kind of things or keep people from escaping and things like that. So there's this huge disparity between the most wealthy of citizens with, like, you know, laden with magic rings and amulets and such things and palaces and then the poorest and like underbelly of the kind of region um, who serve them as in, in a, in a uh, slave capacity. 
So, so that's Gazim. It's kind of um, very. Uh, it's interesting, interesting town, interesting. Yeah, um, and this is in Salim Salam. So it's one of the few established. Uh, what's it called? City cities. And they import all their water and stuff like that. You know, they have like artificial lakes and stuff. They're that rich. They have like magic items that produce food and water. So it really shouldn't, it's inhospitable to live permanently, permanent residence, like really almost anywhere in Salim Salam. That's why most of the people are nomadic desert travelers. But in Gazim, it works somehow. So we got the Kingsbury Wood. So let's actually go from the top now. Move, move from the top. The Orkland North. These are where the Orc tribes dwell, and they have always skirmished with each other and had a certain rivalry between each other. And they kind of just stayed in the north. But something has very strange has happened, and they've banded together for the first time ever in known history. And the Orcs have formed a massive army and actually stormed um, both Castle White, to, uh, Ice Tooth where the white dragon uh, dwells, and the ruins and gill pine, which are now reduced to ruins, and some of the, the rogue um, orcs who aren't part of this strange alliance might still dwell there or who hold this as a base, perhaps. But there are some orcs living here in the ruins, but it was basically just completely annihilated. And same with Castle Ice Tooth, which was you know, on this hill, and it's a quite fortified castle. See, the Ice Tooth clan are the white dragonborn. And um, they they live here, and um, their their kingdom is served by the elder white dragon, um, who is supposed to protect them from these kind of things. So it's very mysterious. This just recently happened, and no one really knows how the orcs were able to band together and to formulate a strategy and have the equipment and stuff to lay siege to this castle that's protected by this powerful white dragon. Nonetheless, it has happened, and the um, White Tooth Clan, well, Ice Tooth Clan was also almost completely annihilated. They're basically extinct versus, but besides a few random ones that escaped because they're very proud and they fought to the death, you know. So if there are any out in the world, they're very few and far between. Um, same with Gill Pine, where it was just basically destroyed. But many of them, you know, fled. These were humans. Uh, mostly population, so many fled to Kirkst um, Kirkstire and um, Berkshire as well. And actually, there should be a little road connecting here. Let's put that over there. There we go. There is a path there. So Fort Avalar was the one that actually watches out and keeps the orcs, you know, from crossing these hills into the lands of Berkshire. And so that's what that uh, fort's primary responsibility is. Berkshire is, um, their patron is the Red Dragon, the Elder Red Dragon. And, um, you know, here Orc watches well for in case just some random Orcs try to come from the north. But then then Arganor, so Berkshire is one of the few cities actually, or one of the few kingdoms that actually has more than one dragon at its service. So... The elder red dragon actually is a female, and she was pregnant when the treaty happened in the dragon death swamps where they were allowed to live. All the other dragons had to leave completely, um, probably to go to another continent or perish, basically, except for the eldest dragons of each of the, one of each of the types, right? Um, or and also the youngest like little babies I guess or something you know like most of them were either destroyed and defeated or had to uh, be exiled um, because they didn't want all these extra dragons running around with nothing to do because dragons tend to cause trouble in those circumstances but Berkshire she was uh, the elder red dragon was pregnant so when her babes babies were born and they were actually twins they were allowed to live and so they actually have been uh, delegated to these mammoth hills, um, what's it called? So up here is where mammoths are, are herded, and they need these two. That's basically the main job of these two younger red dragons who are basically like in their teenage years at this point, uh, 300 years later, because dragons live many thousands of years, at least a few thousand years on average. And so Arganor is kind of the city, that the town that processes the mammoth, you know, the ivory and the meat and the furs and stuff and, and 
sends them down to Berkshire. So one of the main exports is mammoth stuff from Berkshire, um, which is good, good quality, um, good quality goods, you know, where like, it's nice stuff, pretty tasty meat. The fire giant hills, pretty self-explanatory. Fire giants live here. Um, they, this is the, what is it called? The um, caldera or something? Well, basically, this is an ancient volcano that has fallen, a giant one. And there's still the center of it. See, this would have been the rim of the volcano, all these hills. And in the center, there were spouts of, like, you know, fiery <laughs> coming out and little pools of lava. And so when the winds blow from the, from the west, it scorches these trees you see, and um, this is why it's called the Smoke Point Woods here, because the trees, you know, these are the elder trees will still survive this kind of heat and fire, but like, you know, they'll have like small leaves come up and then a wind will come and burn them and the smoke will travel over to the Smoke Point Woods. So they're just barely holding on these, um, the dead woods over here. It's kind of a creepy place. And so, so yeah, these are the fire giant hills, Smoke Point Woods are just a really a large forest. And then we have Alnaria, which is the elvish kingdom here. And below it is the where the green dragon is serves. The forbidden forest is not supposed to be trodden by any non-elvish folk. And you see here we've got uh, Kordorek, where the dwarves dwell. This is the dwarven fortress in the mountains where the copper dragon serves and um, sometimes they go into the forbidden forest there's many wonders you know and resources like like magical berries beautiful woods and medicinal plants rare creatures and even the um the mysterious town of leafy which is cannot be found when it is being looked for. It moves around. It's actually a portal between the Feywild and the material realm. And so one of the things about it is you can only find Leafy when you're not looking for it. So to go on a quest for it, you have to completely forget that you're looking for it, and then it may appear to you, you see. But if you have it on your mind, then you'll never find it. And... Um, it's a connection between, you know, like I said, the, the fey, fairy realm and the material. And it has many, like the citizens who live there are pretty powerful and magical creatures. Um, so that's the Forbidden Forest. I think that's all that needs to be said there. Since we mentioned Kordorek, I think that all that needs to be known is that it's the dwarven city. And sometimes they'll send their rangers in here. And there's a bit of tension between the elves and the dwarves as is to be expected for that reason is one of the one of the things that aggravates the tensions but most of the dwarves live inside the mountains so you don't see too many dwarven cities because they're actually underground or they're like up in the mountains and they're hidden next we have calaris which is a half elven uh well it's it's a, it's ruled by elves but the main the majority of citizens are human, and there is a tension between the elves and the humans. So these are the wood elves. They're pretty down to earth, and they live in the forest, and they protect the forbidden forest and kind of stay to their own. But Calaris are the high elves, and they, you know, rule over the city and actually administer quite a rich and bountiful kingdom. So all of these cities, Lila, Cel Celerand, Flamebrook, Arcus, Port Silver, all of these are... Um, what's it called, part of the, the realm of Calaris and is probably the most wealthy, exporting a lot of food and different trade goods and such things. But um, there is a discrimination between elves and humans where, you know, elves are the royalty and the ruling class and humans are like the peasant class, basically. So there's not much intermingling and that's why half elves, when they are rarely born, are usually ostracized by both both sides because the elves don't consider them pure-blooded enough to be part of the royalty and the humans kind of have a disdain towards these uppity um, elves who think they're better than them basically so they don't seem to get along with either. Um, Glomos, Lyra is you know the big trading town between the two so it's very like wealthy and kind of that's where most of the trade goods go to the north but also here um, uh, Leafless and Port Silver you know, they're, they're both um, 
monthly trading towns as well. Glow moss is an interesting. The glow moss glen is where a lot of glow moss is found, and this is a healing has healing properties. Um, but it can also cause hallucinations if produ- consumed too much. So it's a um, interesting. That's another uh, what's it called resource of this area. That's more particular. There is definitely glow moss in the Forbidden Forest, but you're not supposed to go in there and collect it. Glow moss glen is the main place that produces these healing. Uh, that collects or where that produces the the glow moss. It's a moss that glows, and that has healing properties. Um, Del Meryl and uh, Del Mondis. Um, this is the House of Meryl and the House of Mondis. These are two elven, you know, names, um, and the they were the ones who founded these towns. Uh, we won't go into them right now. The Kingberry Wood is just another forest out here. And I think we've actually covered the lore of this entire region, um, at least in the depth that is appropriate for this time. So let me know if you have any ideas for um, if this has sparked any creativity in you and you have any thoughts and perhaps it shall become canon to the region. And we'll, so we will continue the adventure that way. Peace, God bless, and stay fantastic, everyone.